this is a sort of sermon I give actually, almost, which is, you know how the health food people say you are what you eat. You are what you read, right? And if we can, if we can encourage students to read things broadly in several disciplines bearing on their interests, and if we can force them, as we do, more or less, or we try to in the Agrarian Studies program, to make sense across disciplinary boundaries and leave behind their esoteric vocabularies of their own little discipline, right? Uh, if you're reading across disciplines, if you have friends across disciplines, you're going to be an interdisciplinary scholar, even if you never collaborate with another person, right? So uh, it, you, you are what you read and you are who your intellectual companions are. And if we can change that, we can't change who gives you promotion, who hires you, unfortunately. But if we can change that, we can at least make a step toward real interdisciplinary work. Well, I was part of a reading group with Bill Kelly and Helen Sue, uh, both in anthropology and I forget who else. And I think, I, I wish, and Bob Harms in history, and we decided we'd like to teach uh, a course on history, um, anthropology, and political politics of the peasantry. The Agrarian Studies Seminar, the first one that was offered, and there had been a lot of talk about this seminar because it was team taught, it was going to be team taught, by four or five people. Uh, and the, the, the syllabus was circulating. And in those, day, in those days, when you circulated a syllabus, you circulated the actual syllabus. Like people were handing it around in the history department and talking about it with great excitement. So we were in a big room and it was filled with people. And uh, there were four of us. There was Jim and me and Helen Sue and John Wargo. There were like 59 or 58 of us. And uh, when we, even when we broke into two groups, we were still like 27, 28 in each group. And each group would be led by two of the instructors. It was a unique experience. And I realized how unique it was only when I finished graduate school. I never, take, I never again got a chance to take a course remotely like that. And there was Jim talking about what they were going to do. And I was really blown away by just the, the way he laid out the goals for this course and the questions they were after. The idea that 52 people turned up had not so much to do with us, but it had to do with the topic in general and the idea of people who felt orphaned by their department that was not offering them a course on this theme. And so it seemed to me to be an indication that there was a, an un fed appetite out there for certain kinds of work and courses. And uh, we did it well enough anyway, so that people continued to come in large numbers. Well, it was uniquely interdisciplinary. Uh, I had never have had a seminar with so many graduate students. So the, um, it's more than a critical mass. It's just a different kind of teaching experience or with people from different geographical uh, points of view. It gave me a chance to to read things outside of my field that I probably wouldn't have read if I had just stuck with teaching courses on African history. I also remember when you know we would take turn you know we took turn actually uh, uh, giving the lecture and of course Jim and I still had you know we still have you know very you know, a lot of differences in terms of what power means and, you know, all sorts of, you know, uh, all sorts of perspectives. Um, and I still remember, you know, talking about, you know, China, talking about power and this and that in my way, right? And I can hear him sort of behind me, sort of, right? And I would say, Jim, stop breathing heavily behind me, you know, let me finish. <laughs> I was, you know, I was being very, uh, very um, insistent, but it was just all done with such, you know, you know, 
rapport and, 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 and mutual respect. I mean, it was a lot of fun. So the point is we're listening to one another and having a discussion with one another. That's good for the students because they, in a sense, have room to maneuver. They realize that we don't always agree, that the gods have clay feet, and that uh, they have some running room. Most graduate courses at Yale, if they're not cross-listed as undergraduate courses, you know, have three or four students in them. I mean, the, this course routinely has dozens of students in it, um, PhD students from the various fields. And that's a very, it, it may be historically unprecedented, at least at Yale, to have for, for so many years have a, such a successful, widely subscribed graduate seminar. Anyway, I typed, Jim had gone to a conference in Lake Cuomo, I guess, and came back and wrote this proposal for a program in agrarian studies, which he originally wanted to call peasant studies, and I think Yale convinced him that it should be agrarian studies. And I think I was inclined to call it a program in peasant studies. Because then we were thinking in terms of the peasantry. Um, and other people said, no, that doesn't make any sense because if you're going to do Europe and the US, uh, they don't have peasants anymore. They're farmers. Uh, and so it shouldn't be peasants. And that's how we came up with the word agrarian, uh, and which is better because peasants names a kind of class of people. And we're interested actually in rural life in general. So I typed the thing and I said to myself, this is going to fly. So I said, you know, you're going to get this. What about me? Because I, you know, he was, it was a big grant and, and there we would go and I was there in the Southeast Asia Council, Council and he said, well, you can have any part of it you want. And I said, oh goody, I'll take the director's salary, thank you. <laughs> But anyway, the, it, I was right, uh, and it did fly. And by late fall of 1990, it became clear that uh, both Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation would actually support it. So uh, it could go into effect. <clears throat> and therefore, in early spring of 91, the, the process of setting up an office, uh, hiring Kay Mansfield to be the First, and perhaps, as we learn later, the only program manager who was uh, a staff, senior staff person, uh, had begun, and they were looking to hire at least one, maybe two students to start working with the program as well. He's, well, Jim said, I've got a wonderful assistant for you, and it was Shivi. Shivi was a graduate student at that point in the anthropology department. I must have made a favorable impression on some of the instructors because uh, they very quickly asked me if I wanted to be uh, join the team, and I gladly accepted. As the fall began, we were in place with a weekly colloquium, a graduate seminar, and a postdoc competition that had been basically announced. And uh, and so, it, it was Jim's generosity as a leader of the program to feel that uh, not just his faculty colleagues, but the student, the staff member. Everybody had something to offer, and we all helped craft what ultimately became this signature program that we still have in place. The Agrarian Studies Colloquium, um, it, it began, right, that whole series of visiting speakers and presenting works in progress. So we knew that we wanted to have uh, people come in and give talks. Uh, we wanted, in a sense, to expose uh, people interested in this theme to the best work all over the country. Brings together people from a wide diversity of uh, disciplines and environments, you know, and that's, that's the most refreshing thing about it. it. It wasn't planned in advance to reflect one person's point of view, uh, certainly. He, you could get a political scientist, a historian, anthropologist, real live working farmers, uh, political activists, all sorts of people would be coming in. Um, with all sorts of different takes. And I thought that format was so wonderful. I watched so many people come through agrarian studies 
present with that format. And what was so great about it was it took the, the spotlight off the author and put it on the work. We got that from the Women's Studies program at Wisconsin. Somebody was telling me how the Women's Studies program uh, organized their, uh, uh, their activity. And I don't think anybody else, I mean, there, there are other people who now do that, but they're copying us. Uh, and we copied the Women's Studies program at Wisconsin. But I love the idea and still do. I and then you would be, as Jim put it, gagged, and you would be then, the conversation would open up and around the table could be artists, historians, political scientists, people from Yale, people from outside of Yale, from New York. And you sat there, and of course I'd been informed that this was the model, and I thought, my God, this sounds like medieval torture, you know, um, for an hour or more. Well, I would come back to give a paper at Agrarian Studies in that colloquium. And at the time, what I recall is Jim introducing me as the first student to have gone through the seminar and now to be coming back to present at the colloquium, which I thought was great. <laughs> I, really, I was really happy about that. So my recollection is I was at one level quite intimidated uh, about having one's work read that carefully. Um, the experience of it was remarkable, actually, uh, because that almost never happens, let me just say. You know, where someone uh, uh, who, who perhaps comes at your paper from a quite different vantage point, different discipline. It's this kind of combination of uh, political theory, um, environmental history, peasant studies, um, post-colonial studies, critical race theory, um, global south, geography, um, in a way that is unique, I think and bringing all those things together and, and having it sort of make sense and work. The thing that was different from anything I'd been involved in before was the way we hopped around the world. And we hopped across the centuries. There'd be a, <clears throat> one paper about something that's going on right now and another paper about something going on you know, in the Middle Ages. And so th the whole world throughout the sweep of history was the playing field. I, I can't think of any other venue that brings together that kind of um, intellectual ecosystem in such a productive way, in the way that agrarian studies does. Another thing is that each colloquium is not, is not separate and different. There, there are links. So in some sense, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation um, that has been going on for, uh, for, for decades. That's important. And that's, that's also unusual. And the people who, who, who come to the colloquium are the best. They're, they're the best people. Well, our, our colleagues, junior and senior, it continued to open up our minds, you know? And, 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 and so that's the intellectual content. But in terms of the pers you know, of sort of personal contact, uh, uh, context, it's, sort of, it's also a very, very, uh, a different kind of teaching and exchange. I mean, we're all pretty much equal, right? So what if you're tenured and senior? It doesn't matter, you know. You know it's, we're, we're, we were not judged by the, by the amount of white hair we, we had, you know, on, on our heads. Um, and so there's a kind of irreverence, may I, if I may use the term, and yet a kind of respectful you know, uh, um, uh, comradeship, you know, across, you know, age and across generation and across discipline. What I love about the colloquium space is that it is such a constructive space. That uh, feeling of being in a place where truly scholarly intellectual work is being done, sadly, that doesn't happen all that often in the academy. That's what's special about it. You could argue, some people have, that 
just send us the paper. We don't give a shit about you coming by, right? We, you're the, you're the, you're the, you're the grain of sand that creates the pearl in our oyster, the source of irritation that will make the pearl, and we don't need you at all. You're just an excuse for us to think with you, right? Uh, and to sort of riff on whatever you've given us. Uh, that's a sort of fairly cynical because these people often contribute a lot to the discussion. But the idea is that we're there to create an intellectual community and the colloquium givers are, in a sense, the kind of raw material that comes at one end of it. I really think that I saw my part of the program as being the mother hen to the postdocs. And um, I soon learned that if they were happy, if they had you know, a nice office with the facilities that they needed, you know, a working computer, a, a printer, quiet, uh, they could produce. And the more comfortable I could make it for them, the better, I mean, they were there to write a book. And I, I saw it as my job to make it so they could do that. And uh, we just have to look at all the different books that people have written having been postdocs over here. And one of the most common things they will tell you is that the book was a vastly different project in their minds before they got here and turned out the way it did because of the year they spent here. I counted 158 postdocs and fellows and I can't, I, I can't name all of them because I would surely leave somebody out. But um, I will say that I think every single year we had at least one postdoc from South Asia. and. Some years we had more than one, and what was fun for me was that they would have contests to see who could cook the best Indian meal for me. And so I, I became very accustomed to fabulous Indian home cooking. So it made for a fantastically cosmopolitan group of people who got really close over, over a year. People would get, uh, what they would tell me is, you know, this has just been the best experience of my life. People would say that to me. Uh, when they talked about being a fellow at Agrarian Studies. And you certainly caught that energy around that old ISPS building where it was housed before. I think that building became the Yale Admissions Office. Um, <laughs> let's say no more. Uh, <laughs> it was a great building. There always dinners at his house with a lot of the visitor, with visitors and then a lot of the people who had been at the session would end up with dinner at his house. And at the, at the end of the year, parties and potlucks, which were huge. Um, and I remember being so kind of joyous, such joyous occasions. One, one memorable dinner uh, was before dinner, and I was in the kitchen and all of a sudden Professor Scott goes marching by with a shotgun. I said, where are you going? And he goes out into the woods behind his house and he, you hear the gun go off and he comes back in with a wild turkey by the legs. <laughs> Puts it into, well, you know, took the feathers out and put it there and I eviscerated the turkey much to the shock of many of the graduate students that I would know how to do this but I grew up on a farm and I had done it many times. The one big one was in the spring and I remember the poster saying that all agrarians of the world unite, you know, let's, let's have a party and be merry, you know, that sort of thing. And at that, you know, during that, you know, dinner, he dug a pit in, in the yard and he, he slaughtered, um, I don't know how he did it, but he actually killed a lamb and roasted the, 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 the poor animal in the pit and people were doing dances and singing and, and all that sort of thing. That was the spring festival and so agrarianists of the world unite and we, we, we didn't make revolution then but uh, <laughs> close to it. Actually the proudest thing you could say about agrarian studies is that we've been copied about six or seven or eight places uh, who have developed the same kind of format. Uh, sometimes it has more of an ecological focus. Sometimes it has a focus on soils and so on. So we've been actually a kind of inspiration to other 
places around the world that have programs that are a little like this. You know, that it was a, a unique uh, program in that it became known all over the country, certainly, but all over the world. And the postdocs, I counted up, they came from 38 different countries. So we had a type of agrarian studies West here, in the sense that many of their, if you like, graduates, people who'd come through as postdoctoral fellows and faculty, uh, and they incidentally um, were central in our effort to found something rather like an agrarian studies program here, the Berkeley Workshop and on Environmental Politics. And we were fortunately able to impose the pain and suffering that Jim had imposed on us by inviting him ver very early on in our colloquium series, because we adopted exactly the same format. Um, a paper circulated in advance, gagging the speaker, etc. You know, I think for me the abiding uh, um, uh, uniqueness and um, what makes it so special and important is this ignoring disciplinary boundaries. You know, when we are there sitting around that table, we were all peers struggling to deeply understand something important about the world. Uh, and, you know, in the hierarchical spaces of the university where we live in such disciplinary silos, that's really important. And the motto is, I said, you know, never, uh, what's the What's the proper word for it? Uh, never allow boundaries to define you. You define your own boundaries. And that's one of the themes, I think, for the initial organizers of the agrarian programs like Jim and me and Bill Kelly and, you know, and, and many others. Well, good heavens. Um, the, the postdoc that I did gave me um, my, my best book to date, the uh, teaching, co-teaching, the course changed the way I thought about teaching. The colloquium um, gave me my own ideas uh, in, in uh, my own programs here on how to uh, take advantage of um, visiting scholars, um, and then just substantively it's, it's changed, uh, it's, it's profoundly impacted my research and teaching um, on agrarian societies. All of the uh, for me now over, uh, well, almost over three decades, um, all of the, the inputs from, from scholars doing cutting edge, really the scholars doing the cutting edge work in the field, uh, interacting with them um, under Jim's watchful eye over three decades is, I mean, it's, it's been an immeasurable impact. And that new scholarship gets worked through agrarian studies. I, you know, I, I read, um, uh, uh, I've read books in recent years that are prize-winning books in environmental history, for example. Um, where I read the acknowledgments and the author says, I went to Yale on a postdoc in something or other and, and stumbled into agrarian studies. And this book bears the imprint of that colloquium, which kind of became an inspiration for me. You know, all kinds of people sort of end up being drawn into the orbit of it. And that's the best of a kind of academic intellectual program. The longevity, the number of people who have passed through and the creativity I think are the things that have sort of made it magical, right? It's not just a lecture series. Um, it's not just a one-off visit and then the person's gone. These people are here for a year. Um, um, you know, the, 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 the presenters get 
you know, a really important feedback. That's been one of the most amazing things I think Agarian Studies has accomplished. And we see the evidence of that in people's careers and their trajectories, in the work they have written, the research they've carried out uh, by themselves or in, uh, in collaborations they forged at Agrarian Studies and so forth. Some centers do persist um, when they are uh, funded by the university and part of the university's identification. So one can't imagine Johns Hopkins just deciding, you know, the Center for Strategic Studies uh, has, uh, has uh, lasted long enough or, um, you know, has run out its lifetime. There's certain things that are part of the central mission of the university. I would have hoped that by now agrarian studies was perceived that way. The agrarian studies has been such a great institution, has given so much to so many people. I also hope it will continue to flourish and, and there will come a time when maybe Jim won't be involved with it and maybe I won't be involved with it, but I hope others will be and this program in the spirit in which it has been founded and flourished in the last three decades can continue for some more time because I think that will be beneficial to a lot of people. So I, that's my hope. I just wish agrarian studies go on forever. That's what I would wish. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that it has shaped a whole generation, two generations of scholarship now and we are all the richer for it. Um, I hope we carry on for another 30 years. Is and more or less, well I, yeah. Well, I guess it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, it was mostly my attitude. It, mm -hmm. Maybe there's some tinkering, but the, the basic components of it, I think, have worked out very well. You have. Yeah, I guess I would add, add one final thing. I think um, because political science tends to be swept by fads that everybody's, you know, or many people think are taking over the discipline, and can be hegemonic for a time. Um, one of the good things about agrarian studies is it's always been something of a home for heterodoxy, and I think that's a good thing. So my, my dearest wish for agrarian studies would be that um, you know, if someone is having an, in, an interview in 50 years uh, asking people for an update on, on how the program is doing. Um, it's, it's subject matter, although attention to it waxes and wanes, its subject matter will, uh, will not go away. Um, it's, it's niche here at Yale will remain a niche that, that needs to be filled. So I hope we, we all keep fighting for its, its perseverance. I hope it flies forever, I guess. Um, on the other hand, I also, the last thing I want to do is to have it be Jim Scott Incorporated Enterprises. That is to say, it seems to me it's like my books, you know, once they're out there, uh, it's up to other people to make of them what they like. I'm happy I started this, but I don't re, I don't feel at all responsible for it taking, uh, uh, I think it should deviate according to the people who are running it and interested in it, and I wish it well. At